Welcome to part 9 of the Bread Circus's Phantom Menace Retrospective. Roger, roger. In the last part, we recounted the Battle of the Great Grass Plains. The Gungan army lost that fight, just as they expected to. What turns the tide is air support from their new allies. In this video, we shall investigate the space battle above Naboo. Is it any good? Is spinning really a good trick? If you've seen a few of our videos and feel like we've earned your support, please take time to check that you're still subscribed to the channel. Leave a like, perhaps. Fiddle with the notification bell so you're notified as soon as we upload new videos. Why not join us on Discord? We promise it's only half as bad as that sounds. What fresh hell is this? If you'd like to support us financially, consider becoming a patron or clicking join under this video. YouTube members get access to Imperial rank insignia in the comments section. We can divide the battle plan into three parts, land, space, and palace. The movie interleaves the scenes to present a timeline. In universe, they are all woven together during the planning stage. The battle is a diversion. The Gungans must draw the droid army away from the cities. The Gungans can only succeed by knocking out the ship in orbit. Naboo pilots can't take off until the droid army is committed. Both plans are necessary, they depend on each other. What do you think, Master Jedi? You and the Nabu form a symbiont circle. What happens to one of you will affect the other, you must understand this. The movie really wants to drive home the idea of symbiosis. Even the Star War is built around that concept. War is always risky. Everyone in the Nabu Alliance is prepared for battle. There is a possibility with this diversion, many Gungans will be killed. We are ready to do our part. Blowing up an enemy battleship isn't a plan, it's a goal. Let's assume your pilots can reach orbit safely. What formations and tactics will they use? Are they aiming for any weak points in particular? Pardon me for asking, sir, but what good are snub fighters going to be against that? Remember that the Rebel Alliance always had a plan before battle. They knew their enemy, including specific vulnerabilities to target. An analysis of the plans provided by Princess Leia has demonstrated a weakness in the battle station. Naboo pilots have none of these luxuries. There are no data tapes with complete Luka Hulk blueprints. At this point, they don't have a single target. No shield generator, no thermal exhaust port, no reactor power regulator. We will send what pilots we have to knock out the droid control ship orbiting the planet. However, there's great risk. The weapons on your fighters may not penetrate the shields. Notice how the Naboo pilots don't know if their weapons will be effective. In contrast, the rebels are told which of their weapons will work. The shaft is ray shielded, so you'll have to use proton torpedoes. Based on the lack of planning, I'd be worried. The battle isn't hopeless, rather it's hope-based. Their entire plan is shoot the ship until it dies. On the morning of the battle, a small group sneaks into the city Theed. We'll cover the infiltration of Theed Palace later. At this point, we're only interested in the fighter pilots, a group of highly experienced individuals with decades of training. Contrary to what you have just stated, my boy is an expert on aviation. At this moment, he is probably climbing into the cockpit, and a few moments from now, he will fly it away. You'll have to forgive the professor, he's just daydreaming. There is a blonde nine-year-old here, but he's no fighter pilot. He's only here because there was no safer place. Remember, battle droids found the Queen's ship and Gungan villagers. You can't send him with the Gungan army, or leave him in the swamp. The team has made its way to the royal hangar. Just before attracting attention, Qui-Gon has some instructions. Once we get inside, you find a safe place to hide and stay there. Sure. Stay there. Naturally, the Jedi have work to do. Anakin needs to hide while the warriors end this war. The Queen and Knights will break into the palace to capture the Federation leader. Sabers ignite and our humans run for the hangar doors. Most of the battle droids are distracted, so resistance is light. Only a few droids are stationed inside the hangar itself. As the doors open, our Jedi deflect all incoming blaster bolts. Everyone else scrambles for cover, including Anakin. There are several groups within the Naboo forces. First, the ones with the long orange coats are pilots. 
Yellow with a helmet means a mechanic, the hangar ground crew. The others are all types of Naboo infantry. When they have yellow with hats and armor, those are security guards. Blue with hats are the security officers, a higher rank. Captain Panaka uses this uniform. The final of the relevant types is the palace guard. These wear a similar orange to the pilots, without the coat. The most distinctive feature is a highly reflective helmet. Everyone is here to ensure the pilots get away safely. The starfighters appear ready to fly within seconds. It makes sense for them to be fully armed, fully fueled, and fully charged. What I find more surprising is the state of the astromech socket. Each starfighter comes with an R2 unit, ready and waiting. Mostly yellow, though with some variety. We know there are other astromechs at this point in the timeline. Hello, the Queen's ship has an R5 aboard, meaning they had a full range available. Going with R2s is absolutely the correct decision. The R3 and R4 are no better. The R5 is barely acceptable, and the R1 wouldn't fit. Notice that even the starfighters on the top level have droids. It's likely they used some combination of cranes, lifts, and hover thrusters. Otherwise, the droids would have been left there for days. There's no reason you couldn't do that. Droids can go into standby mode. That malfunctioning little twerp. This is all his fault. That's not an assumption, by the way. I have evidence of that. We've seen R2-D2 wake up, perform a regular scan, then go back to sleep. That's clearly shown early in episode 2. R2 is fully dark, all his status indicators are turned off. Another example is C-3PO in Old Ben's hut. Skywalker and Kenobi were clearly having a personal conversation. 3PO is a protocol droid. Tact and etiquette are his primary function. Sir, if you'll not be needing me, I'll close down for a while. Sure, go ahead. Rather than overhear anything sensitive, 3PO asks permission to shut down. Luke doesn't appreciate how polite this is, but Leia would have. Back to Artu and Anakin, though. Little Annie is having trouble finding a good hiding spot. He ducks behind a yellow box, but that isn't safe. All the best cover has been claimed by the Naboo military, as it should be. While it might look like a crate, this is actually a power droid. Like the famous EG-6 Gonk droid, a self-propelled fusion generator. Finally, someone comes up with an idea to keep Anakin safe. Not the kid, of course. It was R2-D2's suggestion. An astromech droid is built around one function, more than any other. The casing is constructed to fill a standard Starfighter droid socket. Naturally, the first thing R2 thinks of is finding an open socket. The plan is ideal for both R2 and Anakin. Astromech sockets are buried inside the Starfighter's hull armor. Cockpits are also built with a few safety features, so that's better than nothing. R2-D2 whistles for the kid, who follows close behind. The short ones will be safe for the rest of this skirmish. By this point, the hangar has nearly been cleared. Many Naboo pilots have reached their N1 starfighters, all manned ships auto-launching. The Queen's party has now been reduced in number. Every pilot they had is now in flight. We can only see one battle droid left. The second stage of the plan has been set in motion. At this point, the Gungan army is already under fire. By the time Naboo ships reach orbit, there will be droids inside the Gungan shield. Not only does Bravo Squadron need to win, it needs to be a fast victory, while there are still Gungans left alive. Back on the surface, the Queen is ready to leave the hangar. We shall deal with her plan to capture the Viceroy another day. My guess is the Viceroy is in the throne room. Red group, blue group, everybody this way. Right now, she is moving on and taking the Jedi with her. Anakin has found a good hiding place. He's as safe as he ever will be. Hey, wait for me! Anakin, stay where you are. You'll be safe there. But I... Stay in that cockpit. On some level, Qui-Gon has to notice the implication. Anakin will have lost count of how many times he dreamt of Starfighter cockpits. We already know he's a racing pilot. He can definitely fly an N1. Why would he ever leave the cockpit? Meanwhile, the Queen's party approaches a blast door. This particular door needs to be heavily reinforced to suit its role. Arguably heavier than Jabba's door in the Rancor pit. This one needs to hold back a far more ravenous beast. 
Lord Maul. Being a Sith apprentice, he instantly outclasses everyone else in the room. On a good day, the entire Naboo military might defeat him. Today, the military is a 20-man infiltration team. Darth Maul could fight all of them at once and still have spare time to duel young Kenobi. Only two beings are strong enough to even be relevant in that fight. We'll handle this. We'll take the long way. There has been a change of plans. Because of the dark side, our heroes cannot take the quick and easy path. Queen Amidala immediately leads her team in the opposite direction. This entire plan is based on knowing the territory. Of course, the Naboo can find their way around the palace district. However, Maul is part of an anti-Jedi response team. The other half is the droid reinforcements. R2-D2 is the first to hear a very distinctive ringing sound. A trio of droidicas transform and roll in, not necessarily in that order. Jedi have trouble defeating a droidica with shield activated. The Queen's group takes cover and starts to return fire. We gotta do something, R2. There seems little chance of defeating destroyers with a few blaster pistols. Even firing 20 bolts in unison would likely fail. There are no weapons heavy enough to overload destroyer shields. Well, except for the ones built into vehicles. Both Anakin and Artu realize they can help, in theory. We would assume Artu has little control over the ship, especially the weapons. Oops, wrong one. Maybe this one. Nope. Little Annie has never flown a military starfighter before. Even if he had, this ship is unique to Naboo. Nobody else in the galaxy has one, so its cockpit may be non-standard. Anakin is capable of reading, but not the labels on the N1. On Naboo, they speak basic, but have their own alphabet. Some kind of oval markings. We are under attack. Three fighters with some kind of oval markings. Anakin sees controls with labels he couldn't possibly have known how to read. We are meant to think he presses the wrong controls. First, he presses the single largest button in the cockpit. Three. This is the main power for the Starfighter. If Anakin hadn't pressed this one, the other controls would do nothing. The next is a large lever, which turns out to control the canopy. That isn't directly helpful, but it would be far safer to have it closed. The trouble here is that I'm not sure how you'd conclude either one is the trigger. Neither one looks conveniently placed to use while flying. They also seem far too large and heavy to be a trigger. If we take Anakin at his word, oops, he didn't mean to power up the ship. Oops, wrong one. Perhaps he's running on force intuition instead of mechanical experience. As soon as the main power is on, the starfighter floats into the air. It starts to move forward and turn toward the hangar door. Either by timing or manual aim, little Annie destroys the droidicas. He has a pair of vehicle-mounted laser cannons, far more powerful than the blaster pistol. We can see green bolts absorbed by the shield. A laser cannon hits a moment later, overwhelming the shield in one blast. One of the shields fails immediately, the same frame the laser connects. The other two keep the shield up for one frame before exploding. All three destroyer droids have been eliminated. What happened to the fourth robot? Ah, who cares? Come on! The day has been saved, and the Queen is free to continue on with her plan. Alas, the situation has become much more complex. It's on automatic pilot! Anakin finds that his starfighter is on an autopilot. A lot of people don't appreciate the implications of this tiny detail. I should know, I was one of them. The primary function is to make sure Skywalker is blameless. Getting into the N1 cockpit is perfectly fine. There is no shortage of ships, trained pilots are the limiting factor. Activating the Starfighter to save the Queen's group? Again, very admirable, nothing to complain about. There was no other way to accomplish the goal. This was the perfect decision. At this point, the script calls for little Annie to fly up and join the space battle. That's a problem for his character. Anakin was ordered to stay in his cockpit. If he then flies all the way into orbit, that's disobeying an order. The autopilot solves this problem. When the spaceship is turned on, it starts flying itself into battle. 
This way, Anakin can participate in the battle without anyone being culpable. No orders were given, no choice was made, this was unintended. While the autopilot carries little Annie into space, let's examine his ship. One notable feature of Naboo ships is their shape. The Royal Starship and N1 Starfighters have quite unusual lines. Extremely sleek, almost organic in shape. They tend to have slender wings with enormous engines at the far ends. It's a clearly different design from the boxy shapes we're used to. Starfighters in the original movies had flat sides and sharp corners. That's the shape of Star Wars technology in general, boxy and functional. For a vast number of vehicles, all you need to draw them is a protractor and a ruler. Even in the case of more rounded ships, there are boxes underneath. The Gallo-Free Yards transport is a perfect example of that old style. There is an ovoid hull on the outside, but the front exposes an enormous hold of cargo containers. Only two examples spring to mind that match Naboo's preferred shapes. The largest ships of the Rebel fleet are from Mon Calamari. As with the Naboo design, these are intentionally different from normal ships. Mon Cal's are used to making hydrodynamic vehicles. The other craft isn't a ship at all. Might be our little R2 unit. Hit the accelerator. Luke's Landspeeder. Its overall shape is very similar to the N1 Starfighter. The fuselage is rather curved, and in both cases it's to look stylish. More importantly, look at the engines. Each one has a cylindrical shape, mounted on the end of a short pylon. That's exactly the description of Naboo J-type designs. It's not that these vessels don't fit in Star Wars, more that they're meant to be different. There has always been variety in the shape of machines. Just look at R2-D2 and C-3PO for example one humanoid, and one walking appliance. The Naboo N1 fighter is commonly thought of as a small ship. Length is actually somewhere between an X-wing and A-wing. The real difference is in the weight. There are a lot of narrow parts on an N1. Nearly half the ship's length comes from a pointy tail. The other unusual feature is how enormous those Nubian engines are. With a lightweight ship and oversized engines, the N1 should have exceptional performance. The most similar ships from the original movies are the A-Wing and TIE Fighter. In both cases, they are high-speed ships with relatively light arms and armor. One could argue the N1 is a better ship than the decade's newer A-Wing. Perhaps the most significant difference is that an A-Wing has no astromech socket. These droids are quite handy to have aboard, so being without one is a loss. Arguably, the N1 is also too small to contain an astromech socket. In the original movies, all droid sockets are top-loading. They'll never stop us. That little droid and I have been through a lot together. You okay, R2? The Rebel hangar comes with a set of cranes to hoist an R2 above the ship. This doesn't work with the design of the N1 fuselage. You could add hinged panels, or just load the droid from below the fighter. Even that doesn't completely solve the issue. An R2 unit has shoulders right below the neck. Take care, my little friend. That's a fairly good place to keep your shoulders, definitely in my top 10. Because of the unusual shape of the N1's hull, those leg shoulders should stick out. There simply isn't room for an R2's legs to still be attached. We could speculate that the legs come off, stored below the droid's body. Officially, the answer is that the head extends up by an entire body length. The droid's legs stay down in the wider part of the ship's hull. There isn't room there either, that area isn't tall enough. This requires yet more lore to explain. The cross-sections book says that the legs of an R2 can telescope into themselves. A fat, pompous, bad-tempered old tuck! So far we've added two unexpected details to fix a design flaw. In episode 2, this explanation becomes even worse. We see a close-up on R2's legs and there is no telescopic mechanism. In fact, the space inside an astromech leg can be used for hover thrusters. I've never heard someone explain how these details are supposed to coexist. These mistakes could have been foreseen, and maybe they were. Either nobody noticed, or it was considered unimportant. Personally, I don't find the sizes all that bothersome. What really bugs me is that the design mistakes didn't need to exist. Concept art for the N1 accounts for the droid socket. We can clearly see the ship is wider, leaving room for a droid. The final version of the ship is much narrower, a last minute change. Original designs had carefully left room for a proper droid socket. This structure covers the astromech socket, so it has to pivot out of the way. 
It hailed the missile launcher, which was moved down into the fighter's hull. Speaking of which, it's about time we got into the weapon systems. Naboo N1 starfighters are lightly armed. Their primary weapon system is a pair of fixed mount laser cannons. For a small fighter, that's about the best we could possibly expect. Standard TIE fighters use twin laser cannons. The newest Rebel fighter, the A-Wing, also has two laser cannons. So do newer ships like the I-7 Howl Runner and A-9 Vigilance. However, you may have thought of something else. Obsolete fighters, the Kuat Cloakshape and Z-95 Headhunter. These are more likely to turn up in a pirate's hangar than a reputable military. Worse still, those outdated starfighters might have been upgraded. There's potential to modify or replace most systems, including weapons. That's one of the advantages of boxy design, it can be more modular. A Z-95 might turn up with a set of X-Wing laser cannons installed. Just imagine trying to make modifications to an N1. That hull is as small as it can be. There's no room for deviation. Did the design leave room to swap an 11mm coolant hose for a 13mm one? In a way, the A-Wing suffers from the same issue of tight space. However, I'm certain the A-Wing is far easier to repair. After all, it was built upon extensive experience with Y-Wings. After a few years of operation, Alliance technicians stopped putting the exterior panels back on. The Y-Wing is a far more heavily armed craft. It matches the heavy laser cannons, then adds a twin ion cannon turret. As everyone knows, the T-65 X-Wing has four laser cannons. X-Wings were replaced with E-Wings, which have three laser cannons. Later variants of the TIE tend to have four laser cannons, copying the X-Wing. The TIE Defender has four laser cannons and two ion cannons. Old Republic V-Wings have two twin laser cannons. The Jedi use an Aether Sprite with two dual laser cannons. It's all a matter of perspective. Two barrels is not a lot of laser cannons for a starfighter. If you're drinking fortified wine, two barrels is quite a lot. How you arm your starfighter gives an insight into your mindset. In the case of Naboo design, they were going for high performance, optimizing for speed above all other factors. Those are the same design goals as the TIE Fighter and A-Wing, a small, light vessel with half its weight in the engine systems. They were built for high thrust-to-weight ratio instead of the strongest cannons. To make up for this deficiency, the N1 has always had a launch tube. Early blueprints showed this above the cockpit in a large pod. By the time any ships were produced, the pod was unnecessary. Despite scaling down the design from early sketches, Thede Palace found room in the Ford hull. It now had a single proton torpedo launch tube. That's rather uncommon. Most ships have either zero or two torpedo tubes. The N1 also has an unusually large magazine, 10 torpedoes. An X-Wing carries six, and a Y-Wing can hold eight. That means they only need a few seconds to empty their bomb bays. A Naboo starfighter would take several times longer. The N1 features a set of three long tails. Like the Queen's ship, two extend from the center of the engines. The final rat tail is behind the main hull of the ship. These are mostly decorative, an important feature of Naboo design. On the engines, they are said to contain heat sinks. That seems like the worst possible location, putting your cooling in the engine exhaust. Still, given sufficiently advanced technology, I'll allow it. On the main tail, there are a set of electrical conductors. These connect to the hangar's systems, allowing for multiple transfer options. Secure data transmission is a beneficial side effect. Mostly, the tail is a docking and charging interface. So long as the N1 is docked, its tail coils allow it to stay fully charged. A useful feature, but power supply is only one resource. Stocking the cockpit with emergency rations, that's still a manual operation. Reloading the torpedo magazine cannot be done through the tail either. Some coolant tanks may need to be topped up. And then there's fuel. Sci-fi often ignores the question of fuel mechanics. It mostly depends on the available engine and power systems. One answer is to separate fuel from reaction mass. When your drive systems are mostly electric, fuel goes into the reactor. That's how it works on large ships. From the Falcon to a Star Destroyer, their reactors convert fuel to power. We assume either nuclear fusion reactors or something exotic like hypermatter. Fuel is some kind of energy-dense substance to carry around. Antimatter would be the most efficiently compressed way to store your fuel. With all the containment hazards, antimatter is usually more trouble than it's worth. The other possible meaning of fuel is more rocket-based than electric. Fuel is the substance that goes out the engine exhaust. In a conventional rocket, they use internal combustion engines. 
we mix fuel and air, ignite them, and exhaust comes out the nozzle. Electric spaceship drives are quite different, more like a steam engine. Fuel is burned elsewhere, making them external combustion engines. Apart from electricity, the engines also consume reaction mass. We're burning too much fuel too fast, and at this rate we could run out of reaction mass and wind up on the drift. Yeah, but now me, we're going to I.O. A reference to a certain Newton chap with his equal and opposite reaction. Unlike normal fuel, reaction mass can be completely inert. This doesn't work like petrol. It doesn't ever need to burn. Which brings us to Naboo design philosophy and their engines. Someone decided that Naboo would be very eco-friendly. You would never find a plastic shopping bag drifting through their swamp. This extends to their clean-burning spaceship engines. As with the Naboo Royal Starship, most components are from Nubia. The N1 Starfighter uses modified Nubian 221 radial sublight engines. We covered radial engines when discussing the J-type classification. In short, radial engines are inherently more efficient and high velocity. Naboo then modified these to reduce harmful emissions. I have two objections to this. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted scrap pile. First of all, I'm not convinced there is any burning inside the engine. Second, the emissions should not be harmful either. The reaction mass used in sublight engines can take many different forms. We see mention of the Falcon using volatile liquid metal fuel. That makes perfect sense to me. A nice, heavy, magnetic substance. Han is going for high performance above all else. If you're concerned about exhaust emissions, just use a different reaction mass. Surely, nobody would object if your exhaust is pure argon. All I can infer here is that N1 engines run hot in multiple ways. They are high-power systems that cause a lot of waste heat. In a less literal sense, hot refers to exhaust velocity. Naboo tweaked the Nubian engines to use more electricity, less reaction mass. That really does reduce the amount of engine exhaust. Overall thrust stays the same, fewer particles ejected at higher speed. The Naboo concern about pollution seems completely baseless. Starfighters are often considered too small to carry a full-size reactor. Instead, they carry fuel cells or power cells. This is where the Royal Hangar's charging sockets become relevant again. Supposing the entire system runs on batteries, a charger makes sense. That is my conclusion for the N1. There is no fuel aboard, only reaction mass. Other starfighters, like the X-Wing, have a power converter installed. This approach burns the contents of fuel cells in order to keep the power cells charged. I think that gives us a decent understanding of the N1. Quite a nice little ship, artfully designed and capable. For the needs of the Naboo military, they are ideal. Naboo has no empire to patrol, no long-standing rivalries. Their goals are completely different from the Rebel Alliance or Empire. The N1 is a short-range fighter, just like the TIE. Oh, yes. No, it's a short-range fighter. Are there any bases around here? Where did it come from? A fighter that size couldn't get this deep into space on its own. Short is something of a relative term. The N1 has a hyperdrive, so it can roam freely across several sectors of the galaxy. That's all you need for a planetary defense force. Unlike an X-Wing, the hyperdrive range limit is 1,000 light years. Crossing the galaxy in an N1 is completely impractical. Traveling any distance with an N1 would require a supply ship or carrier. The closest we see is in Episode 2, a new senatorial barge. You can tell it's a royal craft, as that's what the shiny hull means. This is said to be chromium, which is illegal for the peasantry to have. Chrome exists in the real world, which isn't typical of Star Wars materials. Durasteel, Transparasteel, Cortosis, and Chromium. The N ones are only half silver, since they're part of the Royal Navy. As the sparge was too small to include a hangar, it has docking ports along its flying wing. That's very clever, it's cheaper to build and accomplishes the same thing. Carrying starfighters on the exterior wasn't a new idea, of course. The Karak cruiser was built with a rack to hold five TIE fighters. According to the law, Naboo hadn't thought of the idea until now. Their previous solution was to form a convoy with an independent tanker. Now, I've heard people say that the Disneylorian show featured an N1. Interesting to see them touch prequel era material. Last time I saw that show, Disneylorian had quite a tiny ship. It didn't look like there was room to mount an N1 socket, let alone a hangar. Still, it could almost work. Since Mandalorian armor is airtight, he can easily transfer between ships, park his long-range ship in orbit, then just open the airlock and move to the cockpit. With a rocket pack, crossing the gap should be trivial. It does strain credulity a little, but I'll allow it. 
A bounty hunter is one of the only people who could afford to maintain a personal starfighter, let alone one so unique and difficult as the N1. I don't know how Disney handled the range constraint, or the difficulty of upkeep. Maybe we'll do an autopsy on it, in a few years. Still, we aren't here to talk about vermin. The big rat. Let's get back to Star Wars. Now that we know the Naboo N1 fighter, we need an opponent. What? What did you say? As luck would have it, the Trade Federation has just the thing. In the modern era, we call them Vulture Droids. Much like naming Battle Droids B1, this was a new development. Originally, we just called them Droid Starfighters. It's unclear if Vulture was a new bit of in-universe slang. General Grievous' ship is directly ahead. The one crawling with Vulture Droids. The name is appropriate. They are menacing omens of death, and somewhat larger than you might prefer them to be. I'm the giant rat that makes all of the rules. Officially, vultures are 3.5 to 3.6 meters long. That's clearly not true in the movie. Vultures are roughly five times the height of a B-1 battle droid. A B-1 is 1.9 meters tall, so should be at least half as tall as the Vulture. Joint starfighters must be at least 10 meters long. As it happens, that's exactly the size of a small starfighter. One of the defining features of the prequel era is what's missing. No Star Destroyers, no TIE Fighters, no Empire at all. Trade Federation starfighters are a completely different design. There is a vague resemblance to various TIEs, especially if you have your eyes closed. The curved wings are a little like a TIE Advanced X-1. When in attack posture, the wings have a gap like a TIE Interceptor. I'll admit these are tenuous, but they aren't accidental. We have official confirmation in descriptions of concept art. Early drawings are based on the TIE line. All the later variants still have the TIE series at its heart. In much the same way, there is a TIE cockpit and wing on the Actus Interceptor. We're reminded that TIE fighters will exist far in the future. What makes the droid starfighter so different is the pilot. Every other Trade Federation vehicle can use living pilots if needed. Most of the time, a pair of battle droids sit in the cockpit. They even have special paintwork for droid pilots, blue shoulders. Pilot droids are mostly used to drive MTT and AAT ground vehicles. The C-9979 landing ship also has a cockpit for droid pilots. Not so for the Vulture droid. They have some form of integrated droid brain aboard, though not a proper one. Like all the other Federation droids, they rely on a central control ship. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of the droid fighter are the different modes. In much the same motion as an X-Wing, their wings open into attack position. Technically speaking, this makes them Decepticons. Unlike the X-Wing and N1, Vultures have no landing gear. When they return to roost, droids lock into racks on the ceiling. That's much like the way TIE fighters are stored. It makes even more sense for droids, which you can run from the carrier's main power. In other situations, vultures transform into a walking mode. They are enormous. They walk on knives. Without this feature, these would be only starfighters. Walk mode is equivalent to the pilot getting out. As a Naboo pilot, there is one system that concerns you most. What weaponry does the droid starfighter have? A very similar set to the N1, but superior in every way. It has four laser cannons instead of two. For torpedoes, it has two launch tubes instead of one. The only question is the quality of each weapon. Some labels say blaster cannon instead of laser cannon. That could mean a far smaller and weaker type than the N1 laser weapons. Laser and blaster refer to the same technology, just at different power levels. The other detail is the torpedo launch tubes. Instead of the classic proton torpedo from episode 4, vultures use something different. It's called an energy torpedo, which isn't a term I would have used. The cross-sections don't show any ammo storage near the torpedo tubes. We have to conclude these fire energy bolts instead of a metal cylinder. I tend to think of a plasma bomb launcher, a semi-stable containment envelope. These can hold together long enough to reach a target, splashing on the hull. Or perhaps a softer target, an anti-personnel roll. In walk mode, the torpedo launchers are ready for use against infantry. Aiming the blasters would occupy an entire leg, and there are only so many of those. Energy torpedoes are a great idea. They have virtually unlimited ammunition, given enough power. 
an exceptional way to increase the threat of a starfighter. There's a slight hitch if you believe in plasma blasters, because these aren't the same weapon. Surely they can't both be plasma throwers. The other drawback applies in-universe as well, shield interaction. Normally, torpedoes and missiles are physical. They can bypass ray shields, as in episode 4. Energy torpedoes fail at their original role, a secondary damage type. Short of their walking claws, vulture droids have no physical weapons, an interesting weakness that is never explored in the movies. With that background in mind, we can analyse the space battle. By the time we rejoin him, Anakin has left the atmosphere. The droid control ship is straight ahead. Look! There they are! That's where the autopilot's taking us! He catches sight of Bravo Squadron, already attacking the Federation ship. Bravo leader is our friend Rick Ollier, greatest pilot in the fighter wing. It's unclear exactly how long they've been fighting so far. The first we see is a diving attack, at least five fighters swooping down from above. There are only about a dozen N1s, so this is half their strike force. This flight path was well chosen, it does offer a little protection. Most of the quad laser batteries are on the outer edge. Their firing arcs have a massive blind spot, above and below the ring. Against a diving attack, only a few turrets are relevant. Three quad lasers on each side of the dorsal antenna farm. We can assume there's a similar set on the ventral side. The Naboo tactics seem good so far. Getting in close will make it easier to dodge, and exclude most incoming fire. At this point, Rick Ollier confirms the deflector shields are working. The deflector shield is too strong! We knew this might be a problem, as Qui-Gon had warned us earlier. However, there's great risk. The weapons on your fighters may not penetrate the shields. The Naboo fighters are slowly being picked off. Their attacks seem to cause little damage. We even see the use of their proton torpedoes. They behave much as expected, apparently bypassing the ray shields to touch the hull. It's away! Negative. Negative. It didn't go in. Just in on the surface. This lines up with the original movie's use of torpedoes. They can go through ray shields, but they aren't magic. Hitting a large ship with proton warheads will have little effect. Unless you hit a weak spot, the damage is superficial. It would be a little easier if our heroes could use their laser cannons. What if the N1 fighters fly closer, going inside the ray shields? 8080s and B1s did this when faced with a too strong shield. You may remember a line from the original movie, Episode 4. We're passing through the mechanic field. Hold tight. Put your deflectors on double front. Red Squadron can fly right through the Death Star's defense field. Why don't the Naboo pilots try the same thing? They say magnetic instead of deflector, but that's consistent. The Death Star uses magnetic fields for atmospheric containment in its docking bays. Clearly that's still a significant force field, something more than a small moon's Van Allen belts. If we look up the shape of deflectors, that distant field is not standard for a ship. In this day and age of computing speed and things like that, our intuitions have been altered. More recent sci-fi has used what you might call a bubble shield. Bolts of energy hitting an invisible wall in front of the ship. This reveals part of a smooth bubble around the target ship. Personally, I most associate the style with Star Trek Next Gen. Those visuals were created by Lucasfilm before the time of the prequels. For their next large project, bubble shields turned up in Star Wars movies. Droidikas and Gungans have quite elaborate shields, but only in atmosphere. Spaceship shields mostly remain invisible, as they always used to. If you imagine bubble shields, there is quite a lot of empty space. Ships in Star Wars use a completely different shape. Ray shields exist as thin layers above the ship's hull. They range from millimetres to centimetres thick. Deflectors are ship shape in the most literal sense. Star Wars fans knew this for years before the prequels were made. As it happens, the movie got this detail right. Shields up. That's just how the universe works. I don't make the rules. Anytime you see a spaceship with bubble shields, it's probably not Star Wars. Back to the movie. 
Anakin has flown into battle, following an automated attack pattern. This is tense! R2, get us off this autopilot! It's gonna get us both killed! For a trained Naboo pilot, this wouldn't be an issue. He would be able to read the labels and disable the autopilot. The only text Annie can read is on a screen, using standard Oribesh letters. This display is little to no help, it just repeats what Artu said. Like his son, Skywalker can converse with an R2 unit. Go back? Qui-Gon told me to stay in this cockpit, so that's what I'm gonna do. There's nothing wrong, R2. Just setting a new course. As men of culture, both Skywalkers have subtitles turned on. R2 has just suggested not being in the thick of battle. With Anakin flying around the droid control ship, it's too late to turn back. He wouldn't be any safer if he turned around and flew away. All that would accomplish is letting the vultures take a free shot at him. The kid attempts to use his established skills to survive the dogfight. He flies close to the ship's hull, weaving between towers and satellite dishes. Computers might be better at three-dimensional thinking than some kid. But if there's one thing vultures are not programmed to handle, it's an outer rim pod race. Treating the battle as an obstacle course across the hull has some benefits. With a huge ship on one side, that acts as cover from droid starfighters. That's the context. He's trying to transfer his skill and experience to space. I'll try spinning, that's a good trick. For a pod racer, spinning is quite exotic. In a starfighter, well, that's more debatable. It sounds like the sort of tip you overhear in a cantina, not real wisdom. If Anakin had been a pilot instead of listening to them, he might have known better. We got him, R2. Still, it works well enough. Good news is that little Annie hasn't been hit yet. The bad news is that three droids are on his tail. Strong in the force is he, but not that strong. These droid blasters are currently set for sequential mode, one barrel before its twin. Only one bolt connects, leaving a scorch mark on the hull. It doesn't seem to cause any serious damage, but Annie goes into another spin. This is about the only evasive tactic he knows. One drawback to spinning is that it can disorient you. Skywalker flies straight into the enemy hangar, perhaps by accident. When running from a swarm of bees, the hive is a bad place to hide. The interior is full of landing ships and partition walls. Luckily, all these bulkhead doors had been left open. It seems unlikely Anakin would have survived otherwise. Had an injured trip real quick, wouldn't you? While the environment is hostile, little Annie is used to it. He managed to deftly weave between the obstacles, just like on a pod racing circuit. By the time he brings his N1 to a standstill, the cockpit is full of red lights. Everything's overheated. That'll be a familiar scenario from Annie's pod racing experience. The only question is why? Was it from being hit by a single blaster bolt? The hull damage appears superficial. It's possible that bolt contained terajoules or kilotons of energy. Converted to heat, that could easily strain the N1's delicate power systems. Equally likely, Anakin had been pushing the engines too hard. He has no idea what the limits of an N1 are. Even when he can't read the labels, Annie flips switches with purpose. These two control panel shots are very similar, you might even say they rhyme. When the machine has a chance to recover, it comes back to life. Yes, we have power. Shields up. This shot is significant because it allows us to see ship shields for the first time. The technology and budget now allow for such a thing. As mentioned earlier, this is the correct shape for Star Wars shields. It also tells us something about the atmosphere. The droid control ship still has life support running inside the hangars. Trade Federation battle droids had intended to capture the pilot. Anakin could have opened the cockpit and tried to run away. For a second time, he reaches for the laser cannons. Take this! Take this! He's attempting to keep the battle droids from reaching the ship. Of course, he still hasn't been trained on the N1's control layout. 
I suspect torpedoes are on the index finger trigger. Blasters under the thumb. Anakin has flown right to the back of the Luka Hulk. In its original form as a freighter, this would be the deepest part of the cargo hold. The main engines would be 100 meters away through a few walls. An array of reactors is even closer, straight down a corridor. Little Annie accidentally fires two torpedoes into the central reactor, which falls into itself. That's very similar to the end of episode 6, flying starfighters into the superstructure. They have a familiar hourglass shape, which lines up with the second Death Star. According to the cross-sections, Anakin has not destroyed the main reactor. The book says these are pilot reactors. If you were performing a cold start of your ship, these would be your first step. The movie seems to immediately contradict the law. We're losing power! There seems to be a problem with the main reactor! Impossible! Nothing can get to our shield! Neboidian crew announce a problem with the main reactor, not pilot reactors. If you remember, the Death Stars were hit in specific places. Main reactors were damaged by a chain reaction, not the initial torpedo. There it is. All right, Wedge, go for the power regulator on the North Tower. Copy, Gold Leader. The book shows large spherical main reactors, three in a row at the back. Just forward of that, the center sphere has its own dedicated reactor. Like with the Death Stars, a precise torpedo hit cascades into total destruction. Speaking of torpedo precision, I have a misconception to share. Ever since first watching the movie, I thought the N1 used energy torpedoes. I thought that was quite clearly implied by the movie itself. We don't see a conical warhead like in the first movie, just glowing orbs. The most convincing evidence was the torpedo tube itself. When we see it fire, there are a series of lines running along its length. They look a bit like rifling on a cannon, except the grooves don't twist. In the split second they're on screen, I saw a set of dark slats. Thin sheets of metal that completely block the torpedo tube. Since the dark lines were still present on the second shot, a torpedo couldn't go through them. The explanation must be that a torpedo flows around the bore obstruction. Did anyone else see the same thing? Perhaps it's more likely if you watched episode 1 on VHS tapes. Young Skywalker has spotted the potential danger. He disengages the repulsor lift handbrake and hits the throttle. The entire ship is doomed anyway. Luckily, none of the bulkhead doors had been closed in the meantime. For those who remember the marketing for episode 1, the next shot will be familiar. This two second clip was everywhere in 1999. It will have been in trailers, on the back of DVD cases, completely inescapable. In the actual movie, I barely saw it on first viewing. We cut to the outside, catching up with Bravo Squadron. It's blowing up from the inside! We didn't hit it! This is the line I'm most frustrated by in the entire movie. None of the Naboo pilots have done any significant damage. Qui-Gon warned them about this, so why didn't they have a plan? At the very least, they should have a weakness they intend to exploit. If the shield is too strong, they should use torpedoes to hit the shield generators. Without a nine-year-old kid, these pilots would have accomplished nothing. You are trying to tell me that a nine-year-old boy climbed into the cockpit of the world's most advanced aircraft and flew it away. Uh, yes. That sounds completely implausible to me. No matter how force-sensitive you are, having a plan should matter. Rick Ollier, the greatest fighter pilot of Naboo, would have some idea. He should have been able to succeed without Anakin's help. The kid wasn't even supposed to be there, and he wins by accident. I have considered this terrible for many years. Irksome enough that I'd go so far as to call it Disney tier. It can be improved with some context, but only a little. This is one of the situations I think the movie needs to be edited for. Now this is pod racing. Anakin has experience with pod racing. He can apply those skills when flying through tight spaces, such as inside a cluttered hangar. We can say no Naboo pilot could have flown inside the superstructure. We could pretend that Anakin had fired the torpedoes intentionally. He noticed the pilot reactors, knew what they meant, and chose to use protons. That's about as much as we can do with the official movie canon. Very much not my cup of tea. It's story time again.
I would fix this by having Skywalker and Olie communicate. Anakin is wearing a Naboo helmet he found in the cockpit. This clearly has earpieces, and law confirms it has a comlink built in. It would be natural for the pilots to interact, like in the original movies. There was constant radio chatter between rebel ships and their home base. When Rick Ollier sees an N1 out of formation, he would act as a leader should. Bravo Squadron would hail Anakin, and most likely fly over to collect the rogue N1. We see a small amount of this in the movie, as they fly back home. Rick and Annie have already developed a rapport. The first thing Rick would say is to explain the controls and how to dodge. After that, he could even command the child to leave battle. I suspect that's the true reason, just like with the autopilot. Not wanting anybody to be responsible for Anakin's presence in battle. That isn't important to me in the slightest. I have different priorities. It would be better if Rick and Annie both contributed something. Perhaps the kid accidentally flies into the ship and he reports back. Using his technical knowledge, he tells Bravo Squadron what to do. If the rebels have obtained a complete technical readout of this station, it is possible, however unlikely, that they might find a weakness and exploit it. Anakin notices a set of pilot reactors, sees how they're configured. This is a jury-rigged freighter, not a proper battleship. He asks Bravo Leader to synchronize an attack on the Luka Hulk's main engines. At the same moment, Annie will hit the pilot reactors with proton torpedoes. This is what causes the starboard main reactor to run away, destroying the ship. Bravo Leader should not listen, but Rick Ollier goes along with it. Until talking to Skywalker, the N1s had been bombing the antenna farm. Naboo had never planned to destroy the ship, only disrupt the control signals. Teamwork with an unlikely ally yields a better result than planned. Personally, I find this solution far more compelling. It makes the challenge seem more serious, the victory more skillful. Skywalker's lucky shot should reduce the casualties to Bravo Squadron. They would have won anyway, but only after a long and bloody struggle. Either way, it ends in a victory. The Gungan army has been saved. The droids are no more. Naboo has regained control over its own star system. That's all we have time for in this video. Next time, we shall capture the Trade Federation leaders. Your little insurrection is at an end, your highness. We'll discuss one or two of the most overlooked devices in the Star Wars universe. That's it for this video. Thanks for sticking around until the very end. We're trying to get each new part out at the same time every week. It'd pay to make sure you've got notifications turned on, so you'll know as soon as that happens. There are two ways to support us. Become a patron at patreon.com slash thebreadcircus, or subscribe, like, and comment. Only the former option guarantees that your name lives on in history. The other is embarrassing youtube -y stuff. Brandon Smith is clearly using a pseudonym. Das Lol Tractor has a Lamborghini tractor he wants us to know about. John Back, a Corolla pilot and a good friend. Kamikaze Velociraptor, the worst kind of lizard. Might also be a girl. Conk, the only thing worse than a Discord moderator. An Australian. Lieutenant Dan's Legs, the only thing worse than a Star Wars nerd is an aviation nerd. The little Annie of combined arms warfare. And Zafrax, who gave us a whole bunch of money and then disappeared. What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? I'm a Toydarian! My tricks gonna work on me! Only money! No money, no parts, no deal!